All right, council member, we are now live on YouTube and you may begin when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert White, council member at large and chair of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. Today is November 4th, 2022. The time is 12.02 p.m. I'm calling to order this public hearing of the committee regarding Bill 24-999 the revised Project Labor Agreement Cost Threshold Amendment Act of 2022. This bill would amend the Procurement Practices Reform Act of 2010 to revise the cost threshold for requiring project labor agreements or PLAs on district government construction contracts from $75 million to $50 million. In other words, district construction projects budgeted at $50 million or more would be required to have a PLA. A project labor agreement is a collective bargaining agreement with one or more labor organizations that establishes the terms and conditions of employment for a specific construction project. The agreement can include wages, hours, working conditions, skills, training, and employment expectations. PLAs are often effective in preventing labor issues from developing and ensuring the safety of workers by providing structure and stability to large-scale construction projects. As a condition of being awarded a contract, the contractor must sign the negotiated PLA with any relevant union organizations. In return, PLAs protect employers, contractors, and subcontractors from construction risks, labor strikes, and other similar disruptions to ensure a timely completion of construction projects. For many years, variations of PLAs have been used by construction owners and contractors in both uh, the private and public sectors. On February 4th, 2022, President Joe Biden issued an executive order requiring the use of PLAs on federal construction projects budgeted at $35 million or more. Advocates of PLAs contend that PLAs lower overall costs through timely completion of projects, higher quality standards, and safer working conditions reducing overall risks of construction projects. Critics of PLAs argue that PLAs discourage competition from qualified bidders and increase the total cost. According to a 2022 research review by PL on PLAs by Colorado State University, most studies on PLAs are on school construction and research on the economic impact of PLAs is limited at this time. However, the research review did find that PLAs did not have a statistically significant impact on the construction costs or the number of bidders. Chairman Mendelson, in introducing this bill, cited evidence that there were not increases in costs associated with PLAs on district government projects as well. Of course, costs may not be the only factor and not everyone agrees on the benefits of PLAs. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Uh, I want to note as we get into a discussion, I know there are strong feelings on both sides of, of this issue. Uh, I don't have a, a position on this bill at this time. This will be a fact gathering hearing. So you will hear me ask questions from every side of this issue that you should not use as assumptions that I have a position that happens in my hearings sometimes. Um, but I am grateful for the people who have signed up to testify so that we can have this important discussion. Um, we'll start to call our witnesses up. We're gonna do two panels of six. Um, and uh, as we turn to our first panel, let me note a couple things. Everyone should have received a copy of the witness list yesterday. I'll call witnesses in the order uh, that they appear on the list. When I call you, uh, my team will promote you uh, to a panelist so that you can testify. At that time, when you're promoted, you'll drop out of the hearing momentarily. You will come back in as a panelist. And uh, at that time, you'll be able to unmute yourself. Public witnesses have four minutes to testify. Advisory neighborhood commissioners have five minutes to testify. With that, let me turn to our first panel. Eric Jones of the Apartment and Office Building Association, or AOBA. Marcus Jackson, Director of Government Affairs for the Associated Builders and Contractors of Metro Washington. 
Jeffrey Long, director of the Baltimore DC Metro Building Trades Council. Cindy Athey, president and CEO of Precision Wall Tech uh, Incorporated. Steve Lanning, business manager for Lyuna Local 11. And uh, Jamel Thrower, IBEW Local 26. Eric Jones, uh, welcome. Uh, good to have you. You can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman White and the members of the Committee on Government Operations Facilities. My name is Eric J. Jones, and I am Vice President of Government Affairs for the Apartment of Office Building Association, Metropolitan Washington, or AOBA. I'm here today to express my opposition to this legislation. Today, I will focus my testimony in four key areas, which are the false narrative that created the PLA mandate, the negative impact that this would have on minority businesses in the large construction community, three, the negative economic impact of the PLAs in the district, and four, the failure of the district to actually implement the current law. Uh, I'm at our time, I'm going to skip some sections of background in my testimony. First, uh, we'll talk of the false narrative that created the PLA mandate. The initial legislative proposal for mandated PLAs within the district contracting was introduced on February 2nd, 2010 as part of B-18650, the District Resident Employment and Trade Stimulus Act of 2010. Following the hearing, which took place on June 30th, 2010, it was decided not to move ahead with the PLA proposal because out, uh, government and outside witnesses showed that mandating PLAs would have a negative fiscal impact on the district and exclude local and minority contractors. Sadly, since June 30th, 2010, there has not been a single hearing within the legislative body of the DC government, which has focused on the mandatory and or voluntary use of project labor agreements or PLAs. The district, however, has decided every time that there has been a major or large project in the district to use them to gain political favor with labor organizations. The current regulatory requirement for PLAs was passed as part of the final language for B21334, the Procurement Integrity, Transparency, and Accountability Amendment Act of 2016, which was introduced in September of 2015. Ironically, there was no mention of PLAs in the introduction. There was briefly mentioned by Mr. Steve Cordian of the Community Hub for Opportunities in Construction Employment, a union-funded nonprofit that would directly benefit from PLA mandates uh, as part of his testimony, but the conversation ended there. Following the hearing, Ms. Victoria Leonard, a former council staffer who at the time worked with Lyunda Mid-Atlantic laborers, uh, falsely stated to Council Chair Phil Mendelson and this committee staffer, Evan Cash, that the Marriott Marquis or Convention Center Hotel was built with a PLA. This information, which was confirmed that summer by via email by both individuals, was important because at the time, the Convention Center Hotel was the most successful law construction project in the city from a timing, budgetary, CBE, and local hiring standpoint. To combat this information, a group led by the Associated Builders of Contractors of Metro Washington, which at the time represented more than 80% of the local and regional construction industry for whom I was employed, held a week of meetings with the council members and the executive. As part of these meetings, Hensel Phelps Instruction, the GC for the project, along with nearly two dozen subcontractors on the project, provided evidence to the lack of a PLA, including copies of the new Convention Center Hotel Emergency Amendment Act, as well as quarterly reports to the DC Department of Employment Service or DOES, which also showed the absence of a PLA. The most unfortunate aspect of this conversation is that even when presented with the evidence that there was no PLA on the most successful project in DC history at the time, the council decided to move ahead and add language mandating PLAs on government projects as part of the committee print. Even more disturbing is the fact that there was no discussion and or interaction with community stakeholders impact the companies or the public. Now to the negative impact on local businesses and CBEs. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2021, just over 6% of private sector workers were members of or represented by our labor unions. Additionally, the district is one of just over 30 states that had union representation below the national average of 10.3%. When you consider that only 12.6% of the construction industry workforce is represented by organized labor, this highlights why the man mandating PLAs <clears throat> would have a negative impact on in industry. Further, union membership coverage database has shown that only 11.3% of DC's construction workforce is organized labor. As a matter of time, I'll, I'll conclude my testimony here and allow you to read the rest. I will close in saying that any conversation about the fact that PLAs does not increase costs is factually incorrect and has been stated by the last two 
chief financial officers, and it was also part of the 2020 and 2021 Budget Support Act, in which the district stated that it had to increase costs on Benjamin Banneker High School by nearly $60 million because of the previously stated project labor agreement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Marcus Jackson, welcome. You can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman White, members of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. For the record, my name is Marcus Jackson. I am the Director of Government Affairs at uh, ABC of Metro Washington, the permanent voice for construction in the District of Columbia. I'm pleased to present ABC's views on Bill 24999, the Revised Project Labor Agreement Cost Threshold um, Amendment Act of 2022. ABC of Metro Washington opposes project labor agreements in all forms. PLAs are snake oil, sold to the public as a method of alleviating coordination challenges, raising quality standards, and preventing work disruptions. These are all contrite justifications that lack any foundation in real world data. Um, a, a more honest case for PLAs would simply be this. PLAs steer contracts on public uh, construction projects to contractors with a unionized workforce at the expense of residents and taxpayers. Um, before I delve further into this bill, specifically, I want to put a few uh, points on the record. Um, any individual can join a construction labor union in the district and by signing up uh, at a local uh, union hiring hall. Despite the ease with which one can join a construction labor union, only 4% of the district uh, construction workers have chosen to do so. Just like employees of the district uh, council construction workers um, in the city see little to no value in joining a labor union. Uh, that's number one, number two. Uh, number three, according to the US uh, Department of Labor over the last decade, there have been uh, only seven work stoppages in the construction industry, and that's in the entire United States. Not, not a single one of these uh, occurred in the district or in the metropolitan Washington area, in fact, there have been um, no construction work stoppages in this region in over the last 30 years. Um, base wages on district supported uh, construction projects are determined by Davis-Bacon Act. They are the same with or without a PLA. But under a PLA, up to 34% of a worker's take home pay is diverted into union coffers with no residual benefit to the worker. And number five, the recent White House executive order on PLAs, which is not a law, uh, contains a laundry list of exceptions to a PLA mandate on federal contract uh, construction projects, including uh, a one for exemptions, for instance, when a PLA would frustrate a free or open competition. This exemption will swallow the rule because uh, PLAs will also fraught free and open competition. This was not uh, done by accident. Um, and lastly, with uh, interest rates and inflation both on the rise, as well as continued supply chain issues impacting construction, uh, the council's decision to impose additional cost drivers in the form of PLAs on project would uh, particular, it's particularly tone deaf in our opinion. Now to the bill specifically. Like all PLA bills, Bill 2499 uh, will result in fewer district residents, businesses, particularly minority owned businesses working on district procured uh, construction projects. In general, non-union construction will not work on PLA projects uh, for a good reason. PLAs require employers, even non-employers, uh, to make contributions to union pension funds uh, during the term of the PLA project. Uh, the mere act of contributing to one of these funds, however, opens construction firms up to uh, limited and unknown, unknowable withdrawal liability. Um, I'm gonna basically get to the close of my um, presentation, but. Um, one point in a recent study that the Rand Corporation on public uh, on project in Los Angeles to build 10,000 units of affordable housing found that the PLA, uh, that the, the project cost an additional 14.5 in extra cost, resulting in 800 fewer units built. Think about that. 800 fewer families in California will receive affordable housing because LA uh, City Council caved to the demands for PLA. The last, uh, the last PLA uh, cost the district uh, $26.2 million annually, which is more than the entire budget for permanent supportive housing for families and individuals. Um, and at this time, I'd like to 
thank you for this opportunity. You have my written testimony for you to refer back to. I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much. Next, we have Jeffrey Long with the uh, Baltimore DC Metro Building Trades Council. Welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman White. Good afternoon, Chairman White and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing on B24999. My name is Jeffrey Long. I'm the DC Director for the Baltimore DC Building Trades. Uh, we are the local affiliate of North America's Building Trades Unions, or NAP2. For short, we support 22 construction unions in the greater Baltimore, D.C., Northern Virginia region. And combined, these 22 unions represent more than 26,000 skilled craft professionals in the building and construction industry. It's also important to note that our unions also invest over $40 million annually in training. We've successfully graduated students through D.C. Apprenticeship Readiness Program, which provides residents from disadvantaged communities, the opportunity to gain access to skilled craft apprenticeship training. On behalf of the building trades, I first would like to thank Chairman Mendelson for introducing this bill. It lowers DC's PLA threshold to $50 million from $75 million to be more in line with the $35 million federal PLA threshold established by President Biden in his February 4th executive order. Uh, lowering DC's threshold will expand the pipeline of quality union construction jobs, which will be available to DC residents. I speak from personal experience. I'm a son of labor. During my formative years, both my parents were union construction workers that allowed them to start a construction a union company, and their union jobs allowed me to grow up comfortably and to attend college. Lowering DC's threshold will also expand the training and apprenticeship programs available to DC residents that will prepare them for these additional job opportunities. Access to career training, it's a major priority for us here at the Baltimore DC Building Trades. We're committed to ensuring that DC residents benefit from DC construction investments. And consequently, we view lowering the threshold as creating greater opportunity to do, to do just that. Uh, finally, the Baltimore DC Building Trades appreciates the district's longstanding commitment to using PLAs to create quality union jobs for DC residents and lowering the threshold to $50 million is the next step. The timing is appropriate, it's high time, given that President Biden has issued this executive order. Uh, it's my fifth day on the job and so thank you for allowing me this opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer or defer any questions to my colleagues that you may have. Uh, thank you so much and uh, welcome to the new role. Thank you. Uh, next is Cindy Athey uh, from Precision Wall Tech. Welcome. Thank you, Councilman. I might need some more time here. Is that possible? You want me to cut it off? How much more time? Probably five minutes. Five, five additional minutes? No, five minutes. Oh, so that's fine. <clears throat> okay, my name is Cindy Athey, owner and president of Precision Wall Tech, a woman-owned CBE small business in Ward 8. We are a true example of how initiatives like the CBE program has provided opportunities for a well-meaning business to grow. I'm passionate about workers' rights, and I know we share the same passion. I appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. First and foremost, I want to let you know I'm not anti-PLA. I believe there's a place for PLAs in our industry when they are utilized for the intended purpose, which is to protect workers' wages and rights. Over the years, I've signed PLAs and honored them. Although I found very little benefit to the arrangement, I do support the intent. However, there is another side to the PLAs, which is dangerous for the construction industry, especially for CBE companies such as mine. Specifically, the local union is using the language of the PLA to establish a power and to block certain companies from performing work on projects in the district where PLAs are mandated. In fact, the union is using the PLA to gain power to hurt my company because we, we declined signing signatory. When I started the business 38 years ago, it was a struggle. As a woman in construction, I faced a old boys network, which made it extremely difficult to break into the market and even more difficult to grow. But every day, I fought to stay in business and persevere. I had many cultures working together back then from, from the beginning and long before 
inclusivity of the workforce was recognized as a means to success. I always cared for my workers because I've seen firsthand that they are the heartbeat of any company. About 12 years ago, I moved our business to the district and I saw the CBE program as an opportunity to break down some of the barriers to growth. And now I'm faced with, once again, feels like a good old boy mentality with the union lashing out and using the PLA as a means to put my business, to put me out of business. Their tactics included filing complaints with the Department of Labor on classification issues that even DOL investigators agreed stemmed from confusion over the union's own gray collective bargaining agreement. Even the government contracting officer saw it to be a change order. Misrepresenting of the facts in an unwarranted smear campaign against precision with the area general contractors, which is our clients and our workers for a year, filing a superficial claim with the NLRB. Most notably, most notably to my testimony, they use these claims, which they manufactured as the reason to refuse to enter a PLA with Precision Wall Tech on the new hospital at St. E's. The result of this action will very likely be an awarded to an out of town union contractor. The use of the PLA in this manner is unconscionable. I'm gonna repeat that. The use of the PLA in this manner is unconscionable. The union is supposed to protect workers. In this case, they're using the power to bestow on them, to bestow on them through the PLA to destroy my company, which in reality hurts workers. If Precision were to shut their doors, 70 gainful employed painters, including over 25 DC residents will be displaced. That is 70 families that will lose their income source. Unemployment claims, loss of tax revenue, loss of an established apprenticeship program, to mention a few that the district could use, the, they could also impact the district from the union's actions. There is very little governmental oversight on PLAs other than to mandate them. The government imposes imposes many reporting protocols and controls over businesses, including CBEs and small business. Yet the unions are left alone to self-regulate and establish their own. I firmly believe that lowering the cost threshold for mandated PLAs without implementing the proper government supervision will increase the number of opportunities for small businesses to be taken advantage of or put out of business by the union. Please view my written testimony as an example. I asked you, who's benefiting in this situation? Is it the workers? Is it the small business? Is it the district? Or is it the union gobbling up power to control, to make decisions for us all? In closing, if we're going to protect workers' rights, which again is the concept of the PLA, then we must also find a way to protect small businesses from these types of destructive attacks or inappropriate use of the agreements. Once again, I wanna thank you for your time and allowing me to share my thoughts and experience. And it's my true experience and I pray that you hear me. Because if you care enough about this CB, I invite you to get with me on the true facts that happened. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Steve Lanning from uh, Lyuna Local 11, welcome. Uh, thank you, Chairman White, for holding this hearing on B24999. My name is Steve Lanning. I'm the business manager for Laguna Local 11 and also a proud Ward 1 resident. Local 11 represents more than 3,500 members across the Baltimore, Washington region. Many of our members live and work in the District of Columbia. In particular, our members have had the opportunity to work on the district's large infrastructure projects covered by the PLA law enacted in 2016. These include building the Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge, Banneker High School, and the new Cedar Hill Regional Medical Center, which is underway on the St. Elizabeth's campus. On behalf of Layuna, I want to begin by thanking Chairman Mendelson for introducing B24-999, which would lower the district's PLA threshold from $75 million to $50 million. As you know, on February 4th of this year, President Biden signed an executive order requiring PLAs on federal construction projects. 
The cost threshold established in the president's executive order is 35 million. B24999 would more closely align DC's threshold with the federal threshold. There are a number of strong reasons to lower the threshold. One of the biggest is that PLAs bring efficiencies to construction and increase the number of locally available skilled construction workers. The PLA on the Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge viv vividly demonstrates this. The bridge was completed one month early. One month early. More than 200 DC residents were hired to build the bridge and more than 45 minority and women owned businesses were part of the project representing 91 million in contracting opportunities. By lowering DC's threshold, we'll be able to create more quality union jobs that provide DC residents with family supporting wages, family health insurance, and a pension. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and support the B24999. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, finally, for this panel, Jamel Thrower from IBEW Local 26. Thank you, Chairman White and members of the committee. Thank you for holding this hearing. As you said, my name is Jamel Thrower and I'm a journeyman wireman with IBW Local 26 and also a proud second generation Ward 5 resident. Where I've also raised six children and I raised them six children in part thanks to a union job. Um, I'm here in support of lowering the threshold of PLAs and lowering it to more so reflect exactly what the federal threshold is. I've heard a couple of times mentioned earlier about prevailing wage and wage scale and PLAs. So I kind of want to touch that. You have my written testimony, so I'm going to defer just a little bit to touch an issue that I didn't think about when I wrote my written testimony real quickly. DC reflects the federal prevailing wage law, which is the reason I think it should reflect the federal PLA law, the same thing. One of the biggest issues is we do not have the district personnel to modify that. But when you put a PLA in that, you allow other organizations to help police that particular piece. Now, what's the big difference? It's not a big difference except the ability to allow contractors to have wage theft unbeknownst, to get away without doing stuff. And this is a big problem that you have with a lot of contractors. You know, you hear all the PLA do breaks. It really does not raise construction costs. You got to look at it. Is the PLA raising construction costs or is the normal doing business of construction with change orders and different stuff that raise that cost? Very seldom do the PLA itself raise that cost. It's actually the doing simple construction business of basic change orders that is going to raise that cost. When you look at the prevailing wage laws in the district, most of it is on union negotiated wages. So to have a PLA only makes sense in the district especially when you look at projects that will match the federal mandate already. We already fairly mandated to do certain stuff as it deals with wages and different things with the district. Why not go ahead and move lockstep with the federal government in that? I thank you for this time. And as I said, I'm here to support. Uh, I do please accept my apologies. Um, as I get ready to close up, I just want you to remember one thing. Um, this helps district residents, it opens opportunities, it opens apprenticeship programs for them. I can tell you one thing, I would not have been able to raise my six children in the district. I live in the district, I have a house in the district. All six of my children have been through college, two still in college, if I did not have a good union wage job. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm also here to answer any questions you may have. I appreciate it. I have questions for everyone. So uh, let me start with uh, Eric Jones. You, you mentioned in your testimony that PLAs increase costs. Where, where's that data coming from? Where's that data? Uh, first off, is, uh, uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, former Chief Financial Officer Natwar Gandhi actually highlighted this data in his fiscal impact statement for Bill 18650. Uh, so there was multiple data points uh, pointed out in that and it's referenced in my testimony. Additionally, uh, former city, uh, Chief Financial Officer uh, Jeffrey DeWitt also highlighted this data as well. Additional examples of this would be, as I'm sure some folks know, the Wilson Bridge, the Wilson Bridge Project. The Maryland side of the Wilson Bridge was, was built with a PLA, the Virginia side was not. The Maryland side was 20% higher than the Virginia side. This is stated fact. It's also referenced in my testimony. Uh, Again, in addition to that, you can look at Benjamin Banneker High School, uh, a budget which you voted on a few years ago, actually had a line item which showed over the four-year financial plan an increase in the budgetary cost. Within that 
financial plan, it stated that the increased cost was due to the project labor agreements. This is all examples that we've seen time and time again at the District of Columbia that we have no reference to. We can additionally go look at the uh, Laurel Library in Laurel, Maryland. In 2014, the estimated cost of that was just under $3 million. Uh, every bid, including the PLA bids for union and non-union uh, companies, came in above $4 million. The lowest was actually 4.2, which is more than a 25% increase in the cost. So, let, let time me, and time again. Let me, let me ask a, a question that, to, to, to challenge that. Um, and, and to help me understand. Um, so someone might argue that the increased costs that you're pointing to from PLAs is reflects the lack of, of wage that they're underpaying or reflects paying workers better, which is something that as a policy matter, we would support. Is is that where- That's possibly- factually, that, that is also factually incorrect. That Mr. Thrower, who actually used to work for the Department of Employment Services can actually tell you any job that ever sees uh, district funding must fall under prevailing wage with Davis Bacon. I mean, Davis Bacon. Davis Bacon is actually in this region the union pay scale because non-union companies, as Ms. Athey can tell you, by and large, don't respond to these surveys. Moreover, if you go back and look at during the time of Dr. Uh, I'm trying to blank on the woman's name. She was the uh, DOES director, the first one under uh, Mayor Vincent Gray. If you go back and look at it, at that time the city opened up and started finding folks for failure to perform and execute first source agreements. The Mm -hmm. initial filing were 22 fines for 22 companies. All 22 companies were unionized shops, and much of that came from PLA jobs in which they did not go back and do this. Everything I'm stated is already in the government records, which is why I'm stating these actual statistics, because we've seen time and time again that it has not worked. The most successful job that the city likes to tout, and I talked about this in my testimony, is the national stadium. If you actually look at the factual numbers of the national stadium, the numbers that they used to uh, create those results was around 396 million. The actual budgetary numbers from the Clark Hunt Smoot project, if you'll go back and look at the DC Sports and Entertainment Commission report from 2008 that was submitted to the government in its own file, was actually 53,000 more, which is well over $400 million. When you actually add those results based on that 400 plus million dollars, much less of that money and resources was actually done by district residents. We failed in every category from hours worked by apprentices, hours worked by journey persons, CBA, CBE participation, et cetera. We've never seen an example where it's actually worked. We talked about Banneker, which had- I, I think also. the I think the, the Frederick Douglass Bridge was done as a PLA and came in under the projected budget. That's the- we we haven't I haven't seen final numbers. If so, that's the first time in district history that we have actually seen one that came in under budget. The Walter E. Washington Convention Center came in and had budgetary issues. We can look at again Banneker High School, which is on the public, which is on the public file. Everything we've seen in the district has failed time and time again. On top of the fact that it increases calls by more than 20 million annually. And these aren't my numbers. These are the chief financial officer's numbers, numbers that our council has voted on to increase those numbers in appropriations. We can say that it's not happening, but when the council approved this in the FY 2020 and FY 2021 budgets, we can't argue the fact that you actually voted on it and approved it. So we've seen it happen. It's unconscionable that we're considering increasing costs with no additional tangible results at a time where we raised taxes last year and we're facing downward fiscal pressures because, because of a pending, a pending uh, recession. Let me, we've let me... never seen a tangible difference in training because there's as many there's as many licensed and certified apprenticeship programs for non-union companies as there are union companies trade-wise in the District of Columbia under the Department of Employment right, Service. Let me let me pause you. I got to. Uh, there, there's some points that Marcus Jackson made in his testimony that I want to uh, run by by Steve uh, Lanning. You know, one um, one concern uh, Mr. Jackson raised in his testimony that only four percent of DC construction workers join unions. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but uh, PLAs. Um, sort of direct uh, employment to union members, not necessarily to residents. And so the District of Columbia, we have an interest in having our residents work on projects in the district. Um, It seems that PLAs can run counter to that. If we were in the middle of North Dakota, everybody working on a project is probably going to be from North Dakota. But in the District of Columbia, our labor pool is coming from the region. So h- how are PLAs in the best interest of the District of Columbia with respect to getting our residents working? 
Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, uh, thank you for the question. So the district, because it's a district PLA, can put additional conditions related to the first source. And as the Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge uh, indicates, um, we were hitting those numbers on first source requirement. And I would disagree about the baseball stadium. Um, if the journey worker numbers weren't hit, the reason was there weren't enough trained uh, journey workers in the district at that time when the baseball stadium was built. Uh, and the PLA is a way to bring in a DC residents as apprentices to get those numbers up. Um, so yes, it, the district, because they mandate the PLA, can also put additional uh, conditions on the first source requirements or um, others matter, other matters related to residency as well as apprenticeship. Okay. Uh, and, and the district has, and the building trades gladly embrace that. That's our mission. The, what about um, what about with respect to DC businesses? So, like Ms. Ms. Athey's business, we want to see our local businesses thrive. Um, PLAs create a restriction at the sort of entry. How are PLAs in the best interest of the district or how would lowering the threshold for PLAs be in the best interest of the district with respect to protecting and growing local businesses? If you expand, lowering the threshold just will expand the, the PLA opportunities that exist out there where the requirement would come into play. I mean, the goal of the PLA is obviously that transition from let's say a uh, company that's traditionally working non-union to see the opportunity and benefit of working union, uh, the value in that, and then they can transition from that non-union operation to a union operation. And that includes CBEs uh, and other MBEs. There's no restriction on anyone bidding on a project labor agreement mandated by the government. Um, there can be no prohibitions on that. It's open to everyone. And this be, presents an opportunity to understand what it means to work union, where there's a level playing field where everyone bidding that job uh, is bidding under the same terms and conditions. And then that contractor can see the value, whether it's apprenticeship, whether it's the training, uh, whether it's the ability to function properly within a union environment. And it's not the boogeyman that, you know, certain people on this panel have made, made unions out to be. So, um, let me let me turn to um uh, uh Jamel thrower um and um and and uh Jeffrey long if if you have uh thoughts on on these two questions um Marcus Jackson raised in his testimony that he said 34 percent uh, of um uh wages uh under PLAs go to the unions uh is 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 that accurate or within the realm of, of being accurate not down to the certain percentage but is is there a significant percentage of wages uh under a pla uh, for a worker that would go to the union so 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 that's that's slightly inaccurate um the percentage is inaccurate um what he's referencing there is generally so on when it's a pla the additional friends benefit packages are paid into the union friends benefit packages for that employee. So whereas if it was just a regular district job that had Davis Bacon, they they have two options to pay that wage fringe. They can pay it in pocket, which some do, and some can try to pay it in some type of other plan. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our contractors try to find loopholes to get that money away to different plans that are not legitimate. Um, under a PLA, them fringe plans actually go into fringe benefits for that employee. Um, that nowhere equals anywhere near 30 something percent or 20 something percent. Um, mm -hmm. the, the fringes are, are a percent of the total package, but it is not a large amount of the total package. Uh, so so if I'm if I work for a, a DC company that's that's not a union shop, and I, um, we, 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 we work on a PLA job. I'm not a member of the union. Do I, do I lose some of my wages? No, sir. No, sir. You do not lose some of your wages. Um, one, which you have to remember, if you, if you work for an open shop and you go to a PLA project, um, you're going to actually gain a higher wage, not a tender wage you're going to receive on that project is going to be higher than your normal wage. What also happens is you're going to receive certain other benefits from that local union that is being paid directly in from that contractor. Um, 
and that additional wages are additional benefits that you're receiving that you may not receive um, from your contractor individually. Um, here recently, um, especially in the past 10 years, a lot of our contractors ha have went to finding a, a 401 plan to put the extra fringes so it never goes to the employee pocket anyway. It's something they cannot reach to a later age. So it's not like the fringe is, is leaving or was going into a pocket. Now, there are contractors that do put that into their pocket. So I'm not going to say that, no, if they put the whole fringe into the pocket, that that would not decrease with in-pocket wage. But it does not decrease total package. It only decreases in-pocket. So, um, uh, Cindy, Cindy I, don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but because you're uh, an employer in the district, do you see it the same way with respect to, to, to the wages? If you're talking about my workers, they make more than they work for the union. Their fringes go directly into a 401, not touched. So they're not, you know, they're they're not putting the fringes into the union and paying public benefits and, and the apprenticeship program and so forth. So they make less money when it's a Davis Bacon job. If if it was a union contract, if I'm making sense, in other words, they they make 25 something an hour, that fringe of $11 an hour goes directly into their 401 untouched. It's mm -hmm. theirs when they want it. So it doesn't um, go to any program. Okay. Or sponsors any kind Mr. of program. Mr. Chairman, I think there's, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think there's some confusion in what's not being talked about. The reason we talk about the fact that those employees don't benefit from that, and a great example will be the Washington National Stadium. When you sign on to that uh, PLA and you pay into that that employee benefit program for the unions. When no one's talking about the fact that just like in a regular job, most of those employees aren't working on union jobs for the totality of their career. So if you're not working in those union those union programs for the next anywhere from 18, 36 months, depending That's on the true. trade, you won't become vested in that. You won't become vested in that program, which means you won't get that money back that your employer has put into there. Additionally, what they're not talking about is union. No, no union pension program on a large level regionally has what's called portable benefits. So when you don't have portable benefits, if Miss Athey pays into that union pension program for her employee, and that employee doesn't vest in that program because he's not working exclusively on union projects, he never, he or she never receives that money. That is lost money that Miss Athey has given to that union program, as opposed to paying into the 401k or 401b or 403 program or IRA that her employee is already in. This is the financial implication that no one's talking about. And you have to be vested to actually receive those funds, whether it's union, non-union, non-construction, et cetera. Those employees by and large don't get the best. And we've seen this at the Washington National Stadium because most of those folks who signed on didn't go to work in union projects when they left the National Stadium. So that, that makes sense. And um, Marcus Jackson, I'm actually coming to, to you. Um, also with respect to wages, we do see um, um, more wage theft than any of us would like to see in the District of Columbia. Don't PLAs help cut against uh, issues of, of wage theft and, and underbidding? Are you coming at me, sir? Y yes. Well, I mean, if you think about it, if you look at uh, Ms. Athey, not to put her again on the spot, um, using her as a, a uh, CBE in the District of Columbia, Ward 8, I believe, um, you know, you're paying, and by the way, just to go back for a second, uh, I said in my testimony, it's up to 34%. I didn't say it was at 34. And right. there's three different categories that we're talking about here. Um, union pension plans, that would be considered 19%. Um, you know, extra health insurance costs, that's an additional 9%, right? And then union dues are 6% on average. So that's what we where we get to the 34%. So just to put that on the record so that we're clear on that. But if you think about it in, 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 Cindy, in Cindy's situation and with her company right now, um, I mean, that's the perfect example of how we consider what waste that really looks like. You're asking her to put into a fund that she already pays friends benefits to her employees. I hear, I hear you on that, but but if you can answer my question on the on the wage theft, um, I get your point. I take your point, um, but. Uh, but but we do have wage theft in the District of Columbia. Underpaying hurts people, hurts families. PLAs seem to um, offer a good tool to prevent wage theft. Um, 
What do you spawn at? Where I don't I don't know where where that comes from. That's the the answer wrong. would be Davis Bacon, not PLAs. Because no, I, 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 yeah, I mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Well, let me. I know Jeffrey Long has been wanting to get in this conversation, but before that, uh, Jeffrey Long, I, uh, Marcus Jackson, I, I cut you off as you as you were making a point. Right. Okay, um, Jeffrey Long, please uh, weigh in. Um, Mr. Chair, non-union contractors that have worked on recent PLAs in Washington, D.C. have not had to pay into the health funds or the pension funds. I want to put that on the record. Also, a slightly different topic, but I want to make sure I highlight this as well, too. I believe I heard Mr. Jones um, infer the Banneker High School came in over budget. I want to uh, state the Banneker came in under budget and received the ENR Mid-Atlantic Award. So I um, just want to clarify that as well, too, for the record. Mr. Long, the DC, the DC government budget disagrees with you. And it's factually was voted on, it was voted on FY20 and FY2021. 20, it actually shows a budget overrun. So you can state whatever you would like, but the DC chief financial officer disagrees with your external statements. We can, we can, we can, we can su submit data uh, for the record on, on that. Um, uh, Mr. Thrower. You're on mute, sir. I do apologize. No problem. <laughs> I, I, I want to um, try to somewhat address you. Asked Mr. Jackson a question that that is actually very factual and can and is documented. Whether a PLA helps helps with wage theft, um, and it does, and, and it's documented on a job. Every job that receives district funding is a prevailing wage job, which means it has a prevailing wage requirement. Mm -hmm. However, if you go probably to 10 of them jobs of that's on a prevailing wage, I almost guarantee you, you want to find nine of them jobs that have wage theft issues. The problem is staffing with the District of Columbia. Unfortunately, they cannot get to all nine of them jobs. But I guarantee you, if you go to nine of them jobs, you're going to find employees at each one of them jobs that have a wage theft issue. Unfortunately, we are not proactive in chasing wage theft, we are reactive, which means that a complaint has to go to the um, Department of mm -hmm. Employment Services for that to be challenged. Whereas with a PLA project, it is basically more closely watched when you don't have that same issue and it's being proactive versus reactive. Mm -hmm. It's a proactive conversation, not a reactive conversation. I agree with you on that. Um, Ms. Athey, you mentioned in your testimony that PLAs are, are sometimes used to block companies, in, including yours, uh, who aren't signatories to, to the PLA. Um, how, how so? Well, I think I stated that, um, <clears throat> well, one, in my written testimony, you see where I provided two PLAs, the, uh, the, um, the stadium, as well as the hospital. And you can see that the language in both of them vary to whatever suits, mm -hmm. whatever the union wants. And that's why I talk about governmental supervision Absolutely. over the PLAs. Because, it, it, you know, I'm a good contractor. My guys are W-2s. I put their money into a 401. I, I agree with the union on wage theft or you on the wage theft. Everybody knows that I've testified forever on wage theft. Yeah. I want a level playing field, but what I don't want is to be cut out and um, misrepresented on <clears throat> what I do as a company. And what I was saying about the PLAs, there's another side to it if they're not governed. They can bully their way back into what they've always done in the past, unfortunately, to get their way. And that right now, to me, what's happening at the hospital is extremely unfair. That's why I said in the end of my testimony, anybody that cares to really hear the truth come talk to me and I can lay it all out, the circumstance that happened. On the hospital, uh, and I, I read some of the PLA that prepared for this hearing, it, it, it appears to <clears throat> exclude businesses that have allegations against them, not necessarily yeah. just businesses that have findings. Uh, why would we exclude uh, businesses that have allegations, uh, either for uh, uh, Steve Lanning or uh, Jeffrey Long? Uh, well, that was, I believe, at the hospital, that was a condition of the general contractor. Uh, that was not a, 
I believe, a condition of the project labor agreement, and they just felt it was not in their interest uh, to have contractors who were under investigation or pending, you know, lawsuits, what have you. That's in their purview, uh, and that makes, in some ways, in business sense, perfect sense if you're a good contractor. Um, I just want to say that the, the the GC did not put that in there. I've talked to them. We we can ask them uh, as we fill out the record for this. But I guess you know. But I guess you know. I'm hearing that unions are too powerful when we get our way. But then other people are testifying against project labor agreements that were insignificant and whatever. So I mean, it's kind of like having it both ways. Um, and yet the reality is, and it's again having it both ways on the wages that we're putting our wages into the workers' pockets, but that's only on Davis Bacon jobs. If you talk to any of these private, when they go to their private sector job, they're going to have to pay whatever wages they have to pay to their workers to compete to win. And without prevailing rate, they cannot guarantee that. And most of those workers are going to take a significant pay cut when they work on private sector jobs. So if the goal here, and it's been established in the district of project labor agreements, is to lift workers up on a level playing field, this is a great way to do it. Um. Or, so I, I do want to get um, get some clarity on this on this issue of, of allegations. Uh, um, that that struck me as odd uh, when I when I read that that PLA. Uh, is that common, uh, Mr. Lanning, to to exclude uh, businesses that have allegations against them? I would say no, because we, I, in my capacity, have filed complaints against any number of non-union contractors, and they continue to win district contract work you know, and years of litigation. Um, so yes, that's uncommon, the short answer. Um, let me get one more uh, question um, for, for, for you, Mr. Atlantic. Do, do PLAs, in your opinion, thwart competition? Thwart competition. If you're in the business to make money uh, and you can have a level playing field when you bid a job, um, I don't know what business owner would think, I want to forgo profits on a level playing field just because my workers have basic rights under a collective bargaining agreement. If that's their sentiment, I would ask the district government to say, what kind of companies do we want to do business with? It's just that simple. Um, last word on this, um, 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 Eric Jones, uh, do, do um, PLAs thwart competition? Every example we've seen in the District of Columbia and the region for that part has said yes. Uh, I'll, I'll close with this. Mr. Lannon talked about the Frederick Douglass Bridge. His statement was that we had women-owned and minority-owned businesses. Notice he did not say district-owned, district-based women-owned and minority businesses. We, what we've seen, and we can use the Audi field as an example, while Ironworks was local five, is touted as the local source, the majority of the Ironwork was bid out to two companies, one based in Texas and one with their closest office in Orlando, Florida, with the majority of the Ironwork done by Ironworkers local uh, 933 from, I'm sorry, I think, I think it's uh, 433 or 933, I'm sorry, I forget the number, from Los Angeles, California, and the other from Orlando, Florida. We've seen time and time again, and I've played these points from district government files in my testimony, that we've always seen out-of-town folks coming to town doing work on our government-funded projects when we have PLAs. Do, do you know, is there, I, I find it very odd how little studies, how few studies have been done on, on PLAs. Um, yeah, um, a lot of these seem like they, we should not have to point to specific projects, but we would be able to point to, to more data. But the, not, not the one thing I did, I'm sorry, but the one thing that I did, because I've, I've seen a similar study, was, which were highlight schools, the only school that I highlighted was Benjamin Banneker because it was a after the change. But every other project that I highlighted was a stadium or something else that regionally was not a school because we never have that conversation. And I agree with you. There should be an independent study done that's not paid for by an invested interest, a vested interest, but yeah. we've had no one do so. Um, I want to uh, thank you all. This is not an easy uh, topic, and, um, and I think we all want to see the best for 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 people for the District of Columbia. Different ideas about how we get there, um, and and I, I do genuinely appreciate you all uh, participating in this this hearing. Um, we're going to move to our, our, our second uh, and final public panel, uh, which will, I think, give us some uh, extension of this conversation. 
Um, <clears throat> so let me welcome um, uh, Brian Scotty Irving from Blue Sky Construction and Development. Brian Mattingly, president of Golding and Stafford. John Magnolia uh, from Joseph J. Magnolia, Inc. Rachna uh, Bhutani Bhatt, director of HRGM Corporation. I, um, yes, my staff will let me know if I missed anybody. Uh, is I, I might have said John's Corey Jones is Corey Jones uh, with us? Okay, no, he's not. Okay, uh, Brian Irving, uh, welcome. Uh, good day, Chairman uh, White. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Would you like for me to get started? Uh, yeah, you can begin. Thank you. All right, Chairman White and members of the Committee of Government Operation and Facility. My name is Brian Scotty Irvin, founder and principal of Blue Sky Construction, Blue Sky Development, a black CBE firm founded in Washington, D.C., specializing in uh, residential, commercial, and public facilities. I am, pre I am pleased to be here to present my views on Bill 24999, uh, the PLA cost threshold amendment Act of 2022. I am also the founder of the Black Construction Collaborative, and I speak on behalf on behalf of more than 20 companies based in here in Washington, D.C. on this bill. I believe this bill is a threat to Black-owned businesses within D.C., and the spirit of this bill does not lie in favor with Black companies. Instead, it lies in favor with union shops. I like in my own, uh, I'm sorry, if this bill was allowed to decrease the PLA from construction projects from 75 million to 50 million, it put more, put more strains on businesses like Blue Sky Construction. And if it can go from 75 to 50, what's going to stop it from going from 35 to 25? And if that number continues to go down, it will continue to eliminate black construction firms and uneven the playing field in DC. Mr. Chairman White, small businesses are the backbone of our community and the striving force for the local economy. We build the very neighborhoods all Washingtonians get to thrive in and continue to lay the foundation for the future that lies ahead of our city. Our ability to asset cash and to win complicated projects is our lifeline in the city where construction numbers are close to four to five billion dollars spent a year Black owned businesses are, are struggling to survive and being, being denied assets to capital that we need for our business to stay afloat. Our goal, while the goal of this bill is to minimize labor strikes and altercations and to challenge and will challenge the complications of projects, excuse me, only 4% of the district construction workers are union workers, largely because they have been no real need for construction strikes, work stoppage, or other related disturbance. If this bill passed, it will, it will strike many Black-owned businesses from working opportunities and companies will lose jobs to people outside of the district. Mr. Chairman White, it is clear that this bill will disrail Black businesses and small local businesses in D.C., but 95% of the working businesses, of the workers in DC are non-union workers, just like me, a, a black Washingtonian. 
It is time for our city to set aside projects that solely for black owned SBEs and CBEs and it's time for our city to protect our black construction community. Thank you for your time. I am available to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Brian Mattingly, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. White. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm the president of Golden and Stafford. We're an excavation demolition contractor in Ward 5. <clears throat> we uh, have worked on numerous projects all through the city. Uh, we're a marriage shop company that has uh, employed both union and non-union folks over the years. Uh, we actually did work on the Marriott Marquis project that was earlier mentioned uh, as a open shop company. On that project, I hired uh, four different crane operators from the union that actually worked uh, harmoniously with us in order to get that project excavated. It was a top-down construction where that was really never done in the town before, whereby we went down 95 feet into the ground uh, using the union operators and our uh, open shop operators working in unison, all under a Davis-Bacon wage rate. So the, the, the beautiful thing about that the way that project was run was that it wasn't a mandated PLA. It was a requirement that you uh, pay the Davis-Bacon wages. So the, the union operators that were on the project got paid just as they were uh, spelled out in the Davis-Bacon requirements. Golden and Stafford operators were paid the exact same thing. Quite frankly, our wages are, are, our wages are practically the same anyway. So uh, the difference is those benefits that Golden and Stafford employees receive, the 401k and the health insurance, goes directly in to pay for those employees' health insurance and 401k programs, which they now have control of and, and uh, have immediately uh, for themselves. If that had gone on and been a PLA, I would have had to no longer give them their health insurance. And so I would have had to pay into the, PL, into the uh, union contract and that's sort of where these guys, when it was being mentioned earlier in the program, how they would actually be losing out on some of these benefits. Uh, I would have been meeting the requirement of how much I am to pay these guys, but the way we're actually set up, I still would have paid their health insurance. I would, I, I would have just had a, a cost even higher because I could never see to it that I wouldn't be getting their benefits that I've promised them myself over the years. So I'd have been double paying. I would have been paying into the union and I would have been paying into the one, the program that I already have for them, because I couldn't let their, their health insurance lapse. And they're not also going to get into the other program either. So that would have been a, a catastrophe for all my employees. As, a, as it was, everybody worked hand in hand, union and non-union together on the same project, quite a success. And uh, all we had a number of uh, local, uh, almost, well, actually all our operators really, or uh, DC, we bring them up through the program. And I'm, pr I'm proud to say that uh, one of our general superintendents was just elevated here in this past uh, week. 20 years ago was one of the first hires to go into the apprenticeship program of Golden Staffords through a, a program on Ward 8. And that, that young man, uh, Hal Henderson, has now elevated from uh, graduating the apprentice, being an operator, a, a superintendent, for, a former superintendent, and now elevated to general superintendent. The program works in the district now. There is no need to have a PLA that's going to completely tear apart a system that's been working for the last 20 years. Uh, thank you so much, uh, John Magnolia. Uh, thanks for being with us. You're on mute. Uh, thanks very much, Chairman White. Apologize for my IT experience here. Anyhow, I appreciate the opportunity to testify against this, what I consider to be a very unfair bill, uh, Bill B24-999. I see no, really no economic purpose or benefit to the citizens and taxpayers of the District of Columbia if this bill were to pass. The Magnolia companies 
which are two companies. We have uh, Joseph J. Magnolia Inc. and Magnolia Plumbing Inc. We've been in the district since 1950 and have been, uh, been my father started in 1950 and, and uh, been in business of good standing and paying taxes since then. A PLA favors only one small group, and that's the union, uh, union worker, uh, which is probably around 6% or maybe even less on the construction industry in the Washington metropolitan area. Uh, and I, I don't understand why we would pass a bill that favors such a small percentage and really does not allow for the majority of the workers to participate in what, we, what should be an open and a fair market competition. All work that is controlled under this bill is Davis-Bacon wages. So everybody gets paid the same. Every discipline gets paid exactly the same. So there's, that's where, I mean, that kind of levels at the playing field, whether you're union or non-union, everybody has to pay a wage, which has been over the years pretty much dictated what the union wage was. So every worker gets paid the same. We have, in our company, we have a 401k, we have a, 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 a 401k and a profit sharing program, both. And this all comes under the ERISA guidelines. We have, when we make that contribution, that money goes into their plan. They manage to what, you know, how the investment is and how, the, uh, how, how they you know, decide to do as far as their investment's concerned. And it's portable. If, if our workers go, we have to, if we sign a PLA, a lot of the benefits that we have to we pay in go, actually go to the unions. Our workers continue to stay with our company. We have employees that have been here 40 years. I mean, we've been a long-standing company here in the Washington metropolitan area because we treat our employees fairly. We educate them. We have our own uh, uh, apprenticeship program for part of our trades and some of the other trades. We partner with ABC and, and the register program in the District of Columbia. We have a great relationship with Lewis Brown and DOES. We participate in the summer program, bringing youth kids to, to our company and teach them. We're uh, some of the founding members of the student chapter program in the District of Columbia, taking kids and educating kids instead of some, some kids don't wanna go on to college. We teach them you know, basic labor skills and that type of thing. And they come and you know, work with us during the summer and, and, uh, and gain employment with us. So we're, we're a partner in the District of Columbia. So um, Joseph J. Magnolia is a C. We're also a CBE contractor. We located in Ward, Ward in Northeast and Ward Five, and we're property owners and tax players as well. Magnolia companies employ over 400 folks, of which many are native uh, native Washingtonians and live in the District of Columbia. We're also members of Associated Builders and Contractors, who have hundreds of thousands of workers that would be denied the, the ability to work with such a project because we do not like to sign. Uh, union, the, the uh, PLA agreements, because we're not here to benefit union workers. We're here to benefit our workers, which a bunch of them are, you know, are DC residents. Magnolia has previously worked on a lot of DC projects, such as Duke Ellington High School, Wilson High School, Blue High School, Cordoza High School, River Terrace Elementary, and a, a number of others, none of which had a PLA agreement. And they were all very successful projects. As a matter of fact, uh, Duke Ellington is probably one of the foremost uh, fine arts schools in the country. Uh, in 1999, I was president of Associated Builders and Contractors for the Metro Washington area. And the Woodrow Wilson project came up, was put out for bid. Uh, we went and visited Governor Glenn Denning, who was really pushing for a PLA. I think they got a, a, a lot of money in the cigarette thing with cancer and so forth. And, and, and he went to his delegates and said, you vote for PLA or I'm not gonna give you guys money for your different districts. So he was pushing a PLA. We went over to uh, Governor Gilmore and Governor Gilmore said, hey, listen, you know, we, you know, we're right to work state. There will be no PLA, so forth. The job went up for bid, it was over budget. Uh, president Bush was elected president of the United States. We went to him, he created an executive order that um, eliminated PLAs on federal project and the project cost dropped $450 million. That job wasn't even run yet, but anyhow, the Chambro ended up building the bridge, opening up their competition, still had Davis-Bacon wages and all that sort of stuff. Everybody got paid the same. There was harmony. 
all that stuff, and it saved the taxpayer 450 some million dollars. I'm a taxpayer in the District of Columbia. I've been here a long time. And I, I'll tell you, I've seen the ups and downs in the district. We've been here. We haven't left. We, we have property here. We pay taxes here. And I think it's, it's really unfair for us. We're trying to protect our workers. We would be eliminated for bidding a lot of this work. If oh, but John, I, I don't want to cut you off. You're almost two minutes over time. Okay. So I got to wrap you up so I can move to the okay. other panelists. But I, I will have questions, though. All right. I mean, I've, I've had one more statement to make that we're a taxpayer paying $32,000 a year for the national stadium a, to a total of almost a half a million dollars. And we were precluded from working on that project because of union only PLA. You talk about taxation with that representation. That's it. I appreciate Thank it. You. Appreciate Thank it. You. Uh, Rock, uh, Rock Nobutani, bot, welcome. Thank you so much. And I, I, double that point that John just made about DC ballpark tax. So that's probably for another hearing. Um, my name is Rachna Butani Bot. I run a construction company, uh, HRGM Corporation, that has been based here in Anacostia since 1978. We proudly employ over 50 uh, skilled workers and craftspeople, many of whom are district residents, uh, including myself. As a CBE, an SBE and a resident owned business, much of the work that we perform is for the public sector, either through district agencies or indirectly through general contractors uh, for whom we are subcontractors on both DC government work uh, as well as federal work. As a DC small business, we are deeply concerned about the changes to, propose, to the proposed PLA law. The change in PLA, the threshold hurts small businesses in the district like ours. We're trying to grow and it reduces competitiveness in the district. The introduction to legislation makes it sound great, but I wanna help you understand from our perspective why this legislation is bad for the district. We encourage the council to reject this measure or adopt meaningful safeguards to protect district-based businesses, small businesses like ours. Some of our concerns are first, the PLA legislation provides no added wages or benefits to workers on DC public sector projects. Since construction workers on DC public projects already earn a Davis-Bacon wage, uh, which is typically union set, DC is already requiring contractors to pay a federally set wage scale. Therefore, the workers are already deriving the primary benefit of a union via this wage. Number two, out-of-town unions cannot supply DC businesses with the right amount of local labor. So this legislation would require small businesses like ours to sign agreements with unions, many of whom are not even in this town. Out-of-town unions don't have local labor and they don't really train locally either. So they add no value to us as an employer and they add no value to our local employees. An employee who lives here in Ward 8 next to our company does not have access to a car and has young children, like many of our employees do, would now have to travel out of town to where the unions are actually located in order to attend training sessions and other meetings. There's number three, there's a major cap on growth for district-based small businesses like ours. So recently we signed uh, an, a contract that has PLA and it basically exempted CBEs as long as their contracts did not uh, exceed $6 million. This is an absurd requirement, which massively disrupts our business and drives up costs. Why should there be a $6 million cap for CBEs to be exempted? Because that basically creates a ceiling for our companies to grow. Basically, the proposed change takes an already problematic set of legislation and makes it worse. So I have some amendments uh, that we could propose to the legislation, but um, I wanted to give you an example uh, with regards to the roofing union, which is not physically located in the District of Columbia. You know, I had lunch with uh, the largest uh, local union roofing company, and the guy said to me that if there's a DC resident left in the union hall, it means that they've already hired them and they're not that good. So that goes to the point that somebody else had made previously that the union companies prioritize giving the best workers to their union company. 
as opposed to companies that are non-union. In addition, I had a meeting yesterday with three members of uh, unions, and I couldn't believe how rude they were to a CBE business like myself that has been in business in the district for 44 years. Um, in addition, we were debating about the wage that should be paid uh, for a scope of work. And that scope of work appeared in two union contracts. We argued that that work, it's covered by the roofers union and therefore it is, should be a roofing wage. And what the union person said to me was that they have their own way of deciding amongst the unions, which union will cover different scopes of work. And based on how they decide is how we have to pay, regardless of the fact that the scope of work is clearly defined in the roofers union contract agreement. So they are raising the rate that we have to pay to our workers because they've decided that they want it to go to a completely separate union. It just makes no sense. So the union set their own rules and they're not congruent with anything that we've seen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I think Corey Jones is trying to join us, but has to accept the invitation. Let me just give one moment to see if he's able to join. I, I'm on. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, well, uh, welcome. You can begin your testimony. Thank you. My name is Corey Jones. I'm the president of First Choice Masonry, Inc. I'm a masonry contractor loaded, located in Washington, D.C. We are a minority-owned business. Depend, depending on the number of contracts we receive, we employ from 85 to 200 workers. My company and I strongly oppose expanding the number of DC government construction contracts subject to PLA. I can tell you from personal experiences that PLAs are no friends to minority contractors and minority employees. We have worked on the PLAs and encounter a number of problems. On the PLAs, contractors are forced to contribute to union sponsored fringe benefit funds for bricklayers. These contribute contributions total $12.85 per hour. Our employees receive no benefits from these contributions because they do not qualify for benefits under the benefits plan. Without a PLA, the employees would have the same amount of money in cash. Under PLAs, contractors are also required to hire union workers. In Washington, D.C., there is a shortage of construction workers and only 4% of the available construction workers are union members. To comply with hiring requirements of a PLA, we would have to hire union workers from outside the area. PLAs require contractors to comply with union work rules, which are purposely designed to increase labor costs. This imposes a burden on us and increase the cost of, to taxpayers. The union claims that PLAs are necessary to secure labor peace. That is a make wakes argument. There is no threat to labor peace on non-union projects. And even on union projects, there is no histories of strikes or disruption on construction projects in DC that will create a need for PLAs. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. I'm uh, glad you were able to join us. Uh, we, we don't have the benefit of uh, having uh, uh, labor folks on, on this panel, so, so this conversation will be a, a, a little one-sided. Uh, I did find the previous panel uh, helpful. Let me let me ask first about the statistics several folks use, including at least two on this panel and some on the previous. Uh, only 4% of construction workers in D.C. resident uh, construction workers are uh union members is is that right and where does where does this data point come from uh my, my attorney um pulled up this data it's only four available construction workers are, are union members in our area and council member my number comes from um the black construction collective we we 
have at least 30, 40 shops that we've been talking to. And like Tony Awash, his shop left the union. Um, so our numbers are based upon the members of our association. I appreciate it. And, and while I'm uh, with you, Mr. Irving, uh, you, you mentioned in your testimony that PLA has hurt uh, DC black businesses. Talk more about that. Please. So we, we have issues already when in work. And if you take the PLA from 75 million to drop it to 50 million and to drop it to 35 million, if that becomes, if that, if it gets axed, that's the federal law or the, that Biden signed. If we drop it to that level, it dilutes competition for us. It makes it harder for us to chase work and scale up. We already have problems scaling up now. So where do we go? What's why, the limit? Why? But, but why? So for somebody who's not in the, in the industry, somebody would say, well, you could just sign the PLA and it doesn't doesn't hurt your ability to, to scale up or get work. Well, I wouldn't sign a PLA because of the history of it. I, I'm, I'm a non-union shop. But non-union shops can sign the PLA. Right, to hire union shops. I, yeah. 90, if 90 percent of my clients or, the, or my group that I deal with are non-unions, why would I put sign up for something that would put them in harm's way and they don't want to be a part of? All right. So you 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 have permanent employees in your in your shop. Is that yes. right? OK, yes. so if you sign a PLA, you can't use your workers for, for your section. Of I the can use my workers, but I can't use non-union shops. So my okay. my shops will not do business with union shops. So if Tony A. Watch, let's take him for example, he can he can sign up a union shop, but a union shop cannot sign him up for a job, mm -hmm. if I'm understanding him correctly. Okay, but but with respect to you, so let's say you you become a sub on a PLA. You Your workers uh, who are not unionized can work on that project. Your company can work on that project. I'm still having some trouble understanding what this is. So exactly remember on your first panel how the young lady talked about her CBE business and how she signed a union, signed on, and then ran into a multitude of problems because she was in the union shop and she signed on to be a part of the PLA. Why would I put any non-union shop through that? Um, uh, Rasha, do you, do you have anything to add to, to this question? I'll come to you next, John. So I think the issue is here, and I can only give you an example from our business. So years ago, we were bidding a contract, and it required PLA. And we went to, at that time, the Roofers Union, and we said, we want to sign an agreement with you because this is a PLA contract, and we want to be able to pull people from your union. And we got an agreement sent to us, and that agreement required us to convert all of our long-standing existing employees who we had for 15 plus years and forced them to become members of the union within a specific time frame. And if I recall correctly, it was like 45 or 90 days. So now I was required to make my entire shop union just so that I would have the opportunity to source workers from a union hall because the job required that we use uh, people from the union. So in that situation, I could have employees who might have had this company for 22 plus years be forced to become members of the union just so that I had the opportunity to work on those projects. And I'm happy that the CBE piece of this legislation has come forward to say that we are exempted up to $6 million. But in the case of Magnolia or Golden Stafford, Six million may not be enough to cover our contract. So in that case, what you're doing is you're creating this feeling for our companies to say somebody arbitrarily chose six million dollars to be the cap. And as a CD business, you only have this exemption if your contract is under six million. So if you want to grow, as we want all CD businesses to do, suddenly you're hampered by that because if you do then you have to sign with a union and you have to force all of your employees to become union workers. 
So as a result of that, we couldn't bid that contract because we couldn't source labor from the union, which means that that affected our business because we could have been competitive. We could have completed that work with our existing staff, but because we weren't interested in becoming a union shop, we were pushed aside for that opportunity. I appreciate that um, example. Uh, John Magnolia, would, would you like to jump in here? Sure, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, first of all, I want to go on record that, you know, we work side by side in harmony with a lot of union contractors, whether it's general contractors, we hired union subcontractors, sheet metal contractors, control contractors and the like. So we've got a pretty good relationship. And to be honest with you, some of the union folks hire us because we have some specialty things that we do that they don't do. And we work side by side with them. So I don't have a problem with it. I, ju I just want it to be on a, a fair, you know, kind of playing field. What does happen with a lot of the union organizers, they, if you sign a PLA, the first thing they try to do is they try to steal your workers. They want to unionize you. Instead of working side by side, they want to make sure you become part of the union. And they, you know, a lot of times they bad mouth you. They send rats out to your different job sites and, you know, rats and cheese and all that sort of stuff and make a big public nuisance. They had to have a lot of handouts. Non-union contractors are just, they, you know, we're merit shop philosophy. We have a little different philosophy. We don't pay everybody the same. We pay based on merit. You work your way up. And fortunately, our company, a lot of other companies have done a fairly good job of that. And to be honest with you, we can probably thank the union contractors for helping us do that. Because you, many, many years ago, you know, uh, maybe the non-union contractors weren't as safe and they didn't educate as much and the benefit packages weren't as good. But in the last, I don't know how many years, 20, 30 years, you know, it's that whole scenery has changed where we've now become educated. We, you know, we have apprenticeship programs, we have retirement plans, you know, we, we keep our workers. They work for us and we do everything we can, even during up and down time, economic times, we pay our people. We don't lay them off. You know, they, we don't go from 400 people to 300 people. We use our money in our coffers to keep them busy. They send them back to a union hall where they kind of sit and wait and, you know, that type of thing. You know, everybody's got their own philosophy on how they want to run their business and so forth. We don't like to push ourselves on them. If you sign a PLA agreement, you find them invading your company and trying to get your company to go union. That's a, that's a bit of a problem. And the money that, that, that gets extracted from the employee's paycheck and it goes to the union hall and our guys may, our jobs may last a year or two years. So they don't, you know, they never receive that money. So mm -hmm. if with us, they get the money all the time. And it's, we, you know, we give them the money in their 401, 401k, we give them money in their paycheck. We do both, you know, so but, I think we treat our people fairly well. Um, I, I think doing this, first of all, I don't think it should exist at all because there, we don't have any harmony problems. You know, we don't have any of those kind of things. We don't strike. And I think, and everybody's paying the fair wage on your jobs. All the Davis Bacon wages all pay the same. So why the PLA? It doesn't, you know, you have to tell me why it's really a benefit to the citizens and the, the businesses, especially the CB businesses and the Washington let me, let me, which who's hiring those folks. Let me, let me, let me move to, to Brian Mattingly for, for, for and, and Corey Jones for, for a question. Um, the um the, there was conversations we rounded out the last panel about whether PLAs limit competition. Um, do, do you believe, uh, uh, Brian, that PLAs limit competition, and and if so, how? Yeah, I strongly do. For instance, uh, the baseball stadium had a PLA on it, and Golden and Stafford. Uh, quite frankly, we feel uh, there's really only like two CBs in the district that can really do that job. Uh, we elected not to bid it because we weren't going to sign a PLA. Um, a company from Virginia ended up agreeing to sign the PLA and perform that project. So what happens is it's, it strictly limits the amount of people that are going to bid the work. Had, the, had it just been Davis-Bacon to see to it that all the workers on the project we're getting the same and fair wages, everybody would have had uh, a dozen 
uh, bids on the thing. But as it was, it was strictly limited as to how many people would be willing to sign. First off, the, the, there was no union excavator in town that, that could have done it. There wasn't any. Uh, so then you had to find who would be willing to sign the PLA. And there was a, a contractor from Virginia that was willing to sign it. But that really limited the amount of competition that was willing to go forward with that project. So uh, uh, Councilman White, clearly it's a, it's a big detriment to the, uh, to the price on the project because when you just, you're not going to get competition, you're going to find prices will go uh, unfortunately very high. Uh, and, and Corey Jones, uh, sort of a different question uh, for you. Um, um, Steve Lanning uh, in the last panel uh, suggests I raise a concern of, of PLAs possibly resulting in fewer DC residents working on DC jobs. He suggested that we can uh, change things like the first source requirement to address that issue. And, and I guess his conclusion was that PLAs don't necessarily result in fewer district residents working on projects in DC. Uh, do, do you believe that PLAs um, reduce the number of DC residents working on DC projects? Well, I, I would say it would because to John's point earlier, so if if we have, if we're paying, I think we're paying $45 an hour, which $12.85 of that is fringe. Our employees don't get that. They don't receive that money in their paycheck because it goes to the union. So a lot of our employees, if we were to sign a, they, they, there is no benefit because that twelve dollars and eighty five cents per hour out of their check, that that's a big decrease in their salary. So they they wouldn't even be willing to work on the project. And aside from that, I take that point. Um, if, if you are a sub on a, a project. Will, will you have an easier time getting DC residents on that project without a PLA, a harder time, or is it the same? I, I would say a harder time because our employees will not sign up with the union. And to, to everybody's point, the union pressures your, your employees to sign up. And if they don't sign up in that amount of time, they kick them off of the project. They, they won't be allowed to work on the project. Um, I appreciate it. I, I wanna thank this uh, this panel. Uh, again, this has been a, a very helpful uh, discussion for, for me. We, we really wanna understand different uh, perspectives uh, on this. And I, I wanna thank you all for being part of this uh, discussion. I know it's a, a difficult issue. People have uh, very strong um, uh, thoughts on. So thank you for, for being with us today. Uh, we. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to turn to our government witness, uh, Director of the Department of General Services, uh, Keith Anderson, and we will let him get queued up. Welcome, Director. You're you're on mute. My apologies. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, as you know, it's the practice of this committee to put our government witness under oath. So I would ask that you raise your right hand. Will anybody else in your team be answering questions? Uh, I do have a couple members of my team uh, joining me this afternoon. Uh, George Lewis, uh, our Chief Procurement Officer. Uh, Tiffany Moore, our uh, Deputy Director for Capital Construction, uh, and I believe that may be it. Okay, let me ask them to turn on their cameras. There we are. Uh, welcome to, to, to you both. Um, I would ask that you uh, all raise your right hand. 
Do you swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you so much. And uh, you can begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, and good afternoon, Chairman White, uh, council members and staff of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. Uh, I am Keith Anderson, Director of the Department of General Services. I'm here today to present testimony regarding Bill B24-0999, uh, the Revised Project Labor Agreement Cost Threshold Amendment Act of 2022. This legislation amends law, amends DC law uh, 21-158, the Procurement Integrity, Transparency and Accountability Amendment Act of 2016, uh, to revise the cost threshold for the required use of project labor agreements or PLAs uh, from $75 million to $50 million. Uh, the Department of General Services supports the intent of Bill B24-0999 to establish fair and equitable terms of employment and cost on a project. Uh, but we would like to raise some resource and operational uh, considerations. Uh, the fiscal note from the Office of the Chief Financial Officer made the determination on the initial legislation that project labor agreements on applicable uh, District of Columbia construction projects exceeding $75 million will increase contract costs by an estimated uh, 10%. The agency agrees with this analysis and requests that even if the threshold is lowered uh, to projects valued at $50 million, the additional 10% be retained. Uh, considering the factors of a construction con contract that a PLA would impact, including wage standards uh, and administrative and labor responsibilities, the agency agrees that benefits should be accounted for based on specific needs and circumstances of each project. Further, uh, the agency is committed to meeting the district goal of procuring and contracting uh, with Certified Business Enterprises, or CBEs. Contract negotiations must balance both PLA and CBE goals. It is important to note that this legislation will impact future solicitations. PLAs impose additional operational and financial impacts on CBEs. As a result, uh, some businesses uh, are and will be unwilling or unable to sign these agreements as a condition uh, to be hired for district uh, projects. This leads to a reduction in quality and the number of employees available uh, to work on projects. Uh, fewer companies bidding on projects also limits competition uh, and thereby uh, leads to increased costs. Regardless of labor agreement requirements or inclusions to assist district-based businesses, DGS places a high value on both goals and intends, intends to continue our momentum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this measure, and we stand ready to work with the council to address any needed changes. Uh, I'm happy to any answer any questions uh, that you or the committee may have at this time. Uh, thank you, uh, Director. Um, so the last time the council considered the issue of uh, PLA cost thresholds was when the council passed the Procurement Integrity, Transparency, and Accountability Amendment Act of 2016. I believe uh, Eric Jones mentioned that in his testimony. The fiscal impact statement for that legislation projected an increase of about 10% on bids for contracts with PLAs, uh, but some contend that capital budgets such as uh, Audi Field and the new Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge did not increase due to PLAs. The cost of those two projects actually decreased after the PLA was negotiated. Have um, Has the district collected any data on how PLAs have affected the district's construction projects since 2016? Uh, I don't know that the district has anything uh, uniform that speaks to PLAs, but I will anecdotally speak to one of our projects that we had in the district's uh, in DGS's portfolio uh, that I believe was mentioned earlier uh, in this conversation, Mr. Chairman, uh, that would be the Banneker uh, uh, Senior High School. Um, this project, and I, and I want to be very clear, this project did come in on time and on budget. Um, 
Um, but I will say that an uh, a PLA was implemented in this project and it did increase costs. However, due to the careful planning uh, and project management from the team uh, and our construction manager at risk on this, uh, we were able to the absorb the cost, but still come in on time and on budget. Um, but it did increase costs within the project. Um, so I don't know that the district has um, a repository of information uh, on PLAs, uh, but I can speak anecdotally to some of our experiences. Uh, Tiffany or George, is there anything to uh, add on that? I think from, good afternoon, Chairman White. <clears throat> my apologies, my voice is not as good as it usually is. Um, but I wanted is it to- usually good? <laughs> I, I believe so. <laughs> my, my mom says it's always good, so it's always, it's always right, so. I'll go with that. Now, I, I do apologize if it comes off, but we've seen some concerns, um, as Director Anderson indicated, there was an increase um, based on the PLA, but we've also seen a lack of competition as well, because there's a lot of companies that are not going to um, actually bid on projects because of the PLA, as you, you've, you've heard some of the testimony earlier, but, um, you know, as Director Anderson said, we're here to work with the committee and the chairman to figure out how do we work through some of those issues that may be of concerns that were raised during the, the hearing so far. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I got to note that somebody likes your voice. I just want to pass that <laughs> on. <laughs> it was always one. <laughs> so, so, um, the, so increased costs um, could be bad. It, it could not be bad. If the increased costs re is because of increased wages to specifically DC residents, uh, I would view that as not a, not a, not a bad thing. Uh, if increased costs are, are, are not leading to increased wages for DC uh, residents, uh, then I would uh, view it less favorably. Do, do we have a sense of what specifically that increased costs uh, was a result of? I don't think we have that available, um, but I do believe it's a combination of different issues. Um, but I think one of the issues that has not been addressed, Chairman White, is we are very clear about our intention to make sure that resident-owned business, CBEs, are very much part of what we do in the district. Mm -hmm. So I think that may require some discussions um, with DOE um, when it comes to first source as well as DSLBD regarding uh, SBE participation. So I think there's some impact there that we probably want to explore a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have the information currently, but I think that's an area that probably requires some investigation to figure out how do we make sure, you know, long-term residents, Washingtonians who've been here in the district for so many years that those businesses are not being impacted unintentionally by the PLA. Um, on that point, do, do we see fewer bidders on projects that have PLA requirements? Yes, we do. <clears throat> and, and so we, we, we track that. You, you've looked at uh, various projects to, to understand how many bidders uh, you know, were on PLA versus non-PLA projects. I've been the director since 2016, and I think we've had several projects. And normally, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll, once it reaches 75 million above, we'll get calls from mm -hmm. vendors who well, George, is this a PLA? I say, yes, it is. And so, well, we're not going to bid. So. I've had calls from maybe two or three contractors who normally would bid on these particular projects, but because of PLA requirements, they chose not to. And um, why, do, why do they choose not to generally from your... Um, <clears throat> I think it's a business decision. I think some of the, the the ideas that were raised by some of those contractors, you know, JJ Magnolia, those companies, they've raised those issues that, that they're pretty much a non-union um, shop. And because of the PLA, there are certain requirements that are required. Um, and oftentimes this goes against their particular interest. It could be also um, when it comes to um, risk, some of those bigger companies are going to look at a risk um, assessment and see if whether or not a PLA, like any other issues that they need to look at, is really in their best interest. And most of those companies chose not to bid because of those issues. What type of risk? Somebody on the first panel mentioned that, and there were so many issues that that was one I didn't get back to. Uh, but from your conversations with uh, DC businesses, what what kind of risks are they concerned about with PLAs? I think, and again, I'm not speaking for all unions, but I think there have been issues where particular unions and particular shops are not willing to be flexible, especially when it comes to CB requirements or hiring within, for example, in Ward 8 or Ward 7, where there's always an intention to make sure they're residents in those here actually on these particular projects. 
there could be issues where there are no union shops in the district that supports that particular, um, for, say for example, um, uh, drywall or painters or roofers or something like that. So normally you'd have those dynamics where if I'm a subcontractor within that this within that ward, do I want to not hire folks that are in the ward? And oftentimes, because the unions do not have shops located in the district, or they have no apprenticeship programs, and clearly there's no room for those, you know, subcontracts to then hire DC residents. And I think that's then really the big issue that I think needs to be really flushed out. That you got to make sure that DC businesses are being not being forced out, but really given the opportunity to bid fairly on these projects. And I think that's what we've heard from some of these contractors. So I think there has to be some rules of engagement that allows for DC based business to be more involved and not to be excluded from the process. The um, the chairman um, in his introduction letter uh, for this bill suggested that PLAs might improve the quality of work on projects. That That is a, a common uh, notion that, that we hear from folks who support PLAs. Uh, do do you see that difference in, in the district that uh, PLAs improved the, the quality and um, timing of projects? I may want to defer to my colleague, Tiffany Moore. I don't know if you've seen anything from your side, Tiffany. Um, the feedback that we've, that we've received is that it's more challenging for the non-union shops who are willing to sign PLAs to get additional uh, quality labor from the union because they're not the priority um, of the union shops. Um, so I guess the, the argument that I hear generally for PLAs is <clears throat> PLAs have, uh, you know, you bring in unions, they have skilled workers, um, you know, they get the more likely to get the project done on time and on budget. Do, do we see for non PLA projects, do, do we see uh, more cost overruns or uh, time overruns? I mean, I would say for our projects, we don't do a large, we don't do a, a majority, a majority of our work does not include a PLA. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I think it would be challenging for us to say, you know, our PLA jobs are on time in our budget in comparison to our non-PLA jobs. We just don't have a significant number of them, or at least we have not in, during my uh, time in leadership. Um, but there's so many other factors that come in that that determine whether or not a pro any given project is going to be delivered on time and on budget. And it's really challenging to isolate that one factor. Right. Um, and anybody who claims, you know, that they that they that it can be easily done, I believe, is speaking out out of context, not really understanding all of the different dynamics that go into delivering a, a project, especially uh, within the district that has, you know, unlike other jurisdictions, has a number of of you know initiatives and priorities that we're always trying to meet at the same time on every single job. So, you know, sometimes those priorities conflict with each other, making, you know, making project delivery a challenge specifically within the district and, and shops that are coming from out of state, you know, not even out of, you know, out of our region, you know, they don't understand those things as well. So yeah. it's a challenge. Um, in, in trying to understand um, roughly how many projects would be impacted by this bill. Um, do we have a rough estimate of how many construction projects we have uh, currently or in, currently or in the pipeline that are between 75 million and, and $50 million in size? We can get that number for you and, and submit it to your office. I think just, uh, Chairman What you will see an increase. Um, we think the majority of our school projects normally are above 50, so we do expect some increase in that area. Um, to Tiffany's point, we don't have the actual numbers, but we also see we've had short-term family housing or parks and rec projects that we believe will then be impacted by the reduction from the current rate of 75 million down to 50. So we do expect an increase of projects that will fall within that particular category. Okay. Um... 
And uh, my last question uh, on this, are, are there are there any considerations that we should take into account when deciding whether to have PLAs for projects smaller than 75 million, uh, other than the, the issues that, that, that you've discussed already? I don't really, from my standpoint, it is really, we, you know, we'll operate the same way. We just know that we have concerns and we've heard concerns from vendors across the district, especially CB vendors. So we're very cognizant of that issue. And that's an issue we expect some sort of um, further discussion with the chairman and your committee on. I think that would be a good way for us to at least give some input that we believe would be meaningful. Okay. Uh, I, I, I would appreciate that. Um, it, anything else we should be uh, considering or anything that uh, that I haven't asked about that you want to mention for the record, uh, Director? Uh, not for me. Let me turn to either George or Tiffany to see if they have anything to contribute. Not from my standpoint, no, sir. Tiffany? No, I, I think the, the discussion was pretty thorough today. Mr. Chairman, that would do it for DGS. I appreciate you know for once you you all are not the star witness so uh so you get off easier <laughs> than usual I'll take it I'll take it oh <laughs> uh, well I, I do want to uh thank you all for for being part of uh this uh this this hearing and this uh conversation and and I I, I do want to mention for anybody who was uh, not able to testify, but wants to submit testimony, uh, written testimony is encouraged um, and will be made part of the official record. Uh, so if you would like to submit testimony, please email it to facilities at dccouncil.gov, facilities at dccouncil.gov. The record for this hearing will close at the close of business on Friday, November 11th, 2022. Uh, so send the testimony before then. If anyone is interested in updates on uh, the issue we're discussing today or other issues that the committee or my office is working on, please feel free to sign up for my office newsletter at robertwhiteatlarge.com. Uh, with that, the business before uh, this hearing is the business before this committee is concluded, this hearing is concluded. The time is now 1.53 p.m. and we are adjourned. Thank you all again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and enjoy your weekend. You Have too. a good weekend, sir. Thanks.